Right? I mean, yeah, I, you I agree have to with pick, you. Bring, <clears throat> teach people, you know, bring in the Torah's values to people and um, be saving a lot of money, close those prisons down pretty quick. <laughs> you know? In fact, that's one of the topics I want to discuss tonight is uh, I'm sure it's been spoken about quite a bit with many other rabbis, but the counting of the Omer and its relevance to the B'nai Noach community. Um, I don't know if you can see this uh, in my, I'm still on a little screen. I don't know if I'm on the big screen with everybody else. You could see this here. Um, but uh I recommend this little booklet, this little calendar. It's a spiritual guide to the counting of the Omer, the 49 Days of Sephira by Rabbi, S his, he pronounced it Simon, but it's spelled Simon Jacobson. Uh, let's see if I can, if we can go in a chat here. Um, so it would be, So it was 49 steps by Rabbi Simon Jacobson. And um, he, he runs a center called the uh, Meaningful Life Center. He was actually one of the Rebbe's secretaries. He runs a center that spreads Torah values to all people, universal. Um, now, the reason I bring this up isn't to advocate for someone who's Lubavitch. The reason <laughs> I'm bringing this up is because this book um, basically explains how all the different Kabbalistic um, identi identities of each day represent different character traits and how we can improve our character. For example, this week is hod, which means um, humility. It also means gratitude. It also means splendor. So on the page here, he first defines the week. It's week five. He says, humility and splendor is the Kabbalistic identity of this whole week is different uh, uh, permutations of a mix of humility and splendor with other different qualities. So he says the following, he says, if endurance is the engine of life, because endurance was the quality of the previous week, week four was endurance. This week is humility. So he says, if endurance is the engine of life, humility is its fuel. As discipline gives love focus, hod, meaning humility, and gives netzach, endurance, direction. Humility is the silent partner of endurance. Its strength is in its silence. Its splendor is in its repose. He explains the meaning of humility. Humility and the resulting yielding should not be confused with weakness and lack of self-esteem. Humility is modesty. It is acknowledgement. It is saying thank you to God. It is clearly recognizing your qualities and strengths and acknowledging that they are not your own. They were given to you by God for a higher purpose and just satisfying your needs. So that's basically it. What's the definition of hod? Humility. What is humility? It's recognizing the qualities you have, at the same time recognizing they're from God and they were given to you for a higher purpose. That's the true meaning of humility. And they're not yours. They're a gift from God. He then continues, humility is modesty. It is recognizing how small you are, which allows you to realize how large you can become. And that makes humility so formidable. Now, that is also profound and interesting. He says that humility is modesty. <clears throat> Recognizing you're small, but how great you can become. So, <clears throat> when you recognize that the qualities you have and your talents are from God, on the one hand, they're not yours. So you have night to be, no right to be pretentious, no right to pat yourself on the back about it. But on the other hand, it doesn't really make you small in the sense that you become um, paralyzed or you become 
uh, uh, you become, you lack confidence because you realize now that as before you might've thought, okay, you're such and such, but now you realize God gave me these qualities. That's infinite. Then I could tap into a lot more. What I have is from God. And therefore, if I have, let's say I have certain, whatever quality may be. And even if I have a quality in a small amount, but since it comes from God, it could grow. The potential isn't limited. But particularly in the talents I see God has given me, whatever I've tapped into, I realize this is not it. There's more. That this represents the fact that I have a task in a certain direction. For example, someone has a, an ability to communicate well with people and connect. He could have a lot of good influence on people. So he realizes that, but he, instead of being you know, big shoddy about it, he realizes this is really not him. This is coming from God for him to persuade and, and connect with people to bring them to the right path. And he also realizes that when things don't go wrong, or when he realizes he has certain shortcomings and sometimes he makes a mistake in this area, he's not as good as he originally thought he was. He realizes that it's coming from God and there's a lot more he must be able to tap into because, I mean, from the source, it's infinite. <clears throat> and, he, and, and if he just prays and works on it, he can, he can bring out a lot more inside from his soul and from, and from its soul source. <clears throat> So that's week five, but that's an, so that's this week. That's also an example of, you know, what this little booklet is about. So it's great every day, you know, you can, you read this and you can work on this during the day. It also gives things like exercises for the day. Right now, today was the 33rd Log Bomber. How could I, what a great time to start a class, huh? Start a class on Log Bomber, not a better time. So, so, so Lang Bomer is humility in humility, hode of hode, splendor of splendor, humility in humility. So this is what he says about that. Rabbi Jacobson says, <clears throat> Rabbi Jacobson says, examine the humility of humility. Everyone has humility and modesty in his or her heart. The question is the measure and manner in which one consciously feels it. Am I afraid to be too humble? Do I mask and protect my modesty with aggressive behavior? Learn to cultivate your, your humility by interacting with people who are more refined than yourself, evoking in you modesty and humility that motivates you to grow. In other words, you know, a lot of people have a tendency that they like to hang out with people equal or lower than themselves so that they can feel good about themselves. Because if they hang out with people, to hang around people who have, you know, who are smarter than them, for example, more knowledgeable, or more successful in other ways that maybe they feel a little bit like they're lacking deep down. It's, you know, so they stay away from people that make them feel down a bit, you know, a little bit that make them a little bit um, uh, self-conscious. So he's saying, don't do that. Or if you want to work on your humility, hang around those people so that, you know, they, they remind you of what you lack. But of course, there's another element to this too, and that is the saying in, in last week's Ethics of the Fathers, in which don't be better to be the tail of a lion than the head of a fox. Better to hang around with people of great stature and learn from them than be a leader of among empty and boorish people. So that's the... Try to hang around with those who you can learn examples to go higher. And that's one of the biggest problems, by the way, with today's media. You know, if I could go off on that subject for a moment, but, you know, too much of it brings people down. When, you, when you're exposed to television or movies and the people's behavior or even worse than the average person on the street, so that that could, God forbid, normalize that kind of behavior in a person's mind, even just very subtly. Certainly, we're not le learning any anything better, usually. Sometimes different, but the, typically, that's not what's shown, and that's a tremendous problem. But, pe but see, that's what people want. People want to be patted on the back and, and laugh at other people being more foolish and idiotic than they are, but that's not healthy. That's not the way which what we should be doing. We should be trying to connect with people who are greater than ourselves, who have qualities even better. But the only way you can do that is if you're humble. If you're ready to be feel lower 
so that you'll be around people who and with whom that you may have to say, you know, I don't know. I can't, I don't know that. Can you please repeat that? I can't keep up. You have to be humble to do that. You can't be someone who likes to be pretentious and be able to look down at the people around them or even feel a kind of an equality. You're saying here, try to find people even better and spend some time around them. Obviously, it also fits in with something it says in Ethics of the Fathers that person should make his home a center for, for Torah scholars and also for the poor. When a person hangs, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but someone is, um, uh, is able to frequent with Torah scholars, you can hear their discussions and their halakhic questions that come up and they see how they behave also. They can learn an example from their behavior, which was the old way that people used to learn. Now people learn in books, but people used to learn by example, whether in their home, from their teachers. You know, in the Talmud, there's a lot of times it talks about they learned a certain halacha, a certain Jewish uh, law ruling from the, the behavior of a certain sage. They saw he did such and such in a certain way. And th that's called a masara. That's called the, uh, a, a, an anecdotal story of a, of a scholar. So we can learn a ruling from it. Because if he, be, he conducted himself in that way, involving a certain Torah law, then that, that represents a ruling. And that is a, a fantastic way of studying, but that's what happens if we hang around with people who are on a higher level in themselves and we act with humility. I know so many people from this community have this quality because you're coming from somewhere else and you don't know about, you know, Torah or Torah lifestyle or, you know, or Judaism. So obviously you have to say, I don't know, please teach me. And that already is, is tremendous humility. Now, tonight, now, well, today, still going on in the last few minutes of the 33rd day of the Omer, which is this double humility of humility, which is humility is such a wonderful trait. It's a trait of Moses. And Moses, God, that, the, that the Bible praises Moses and said there was no man as humble as he. How incredible. How is that possible? But obviously it is, of course, possible because since no one accomplished more and yet he wasn't pretentious and yet, and yet he wasn't arrogant. And obviously, he's the most humble person. But even beyond that, he had so many trouble from the from the public. And he took it with patience. Never ending trouble. I mean, there's some stories that Rashi tells us that are unbelievable about Moses. You can imagine he's a man who spoke with God on a regular basis. And yet, when he came out of his tent, there would be people gossiping. If he came out early, they'd say, oh, he got into a fight with his wife. If he came out, if he came out of the, you know, if he came out of the uh, temple late saying, oh, he's staying away from, you know how people could be. So, but the point is that it's not so easy to be a leader. People are always uh, scrutinizing you very heavily. <coughs> um, but anyway, my point is obviously his talents were so incredible and therefore his feeling of indebtedness because realizing that all those talents were given to him from God made him even more humble. And um, Hasidus, Hasidic teachings say exactly his point, that, that Moses realized what incredible divine gifts he was given, but he, he thought if they were given to someone else, they would have done an even better job. Can you believe that? Yeah. He thought if someone else would have given these gifts of prophecy and intimacy with God and so on, that they would have done a better job. So that is incredible level of humility. But also there's a point here is that <clears throat> um, what's incredible about humility is the only way we can really <clears throat> have the divine presence rest on us is if we make space. Rabbi Sachs speaks about this also. Hey, where, and the Baal Shem Tov famously discussed it also. Was asked, I think the Baal Shem Tov or some other Hasidic um, master was asked, where is God? Maybe it was the Kutzker Rabbi. He was said, where is God? And the answer was, wherever you let him. That's who it was. The Kotzka, yeah. So <clears throat> another another answer is, is, is someone pointed to the heart. I think it might have been the Lubavitch Rebbe was one that God is found in the heart, in a person's heart. But it's a similar idea. But the point is, the only way we can really find God is through humility. Is when we quiet down our own passions and our own personal self-centered wants, 
and we look at the world through and silence ourselves, then we can find God. And then and we can find the truth and we can find um, also what our true purpose is. So that's why really, in a certain sense, this day is the day that's most, um, up until Shavuos, up until the day of the Torah will be given, today is almost the most um, auspicious for the resting of the divine presence because it's humility of your mill, the highest level of what in Hasidic teaching called bittel, person's self-nullification, and the kind of a self-effacement to an extent. And that is really the most, most needed quality. And with that quality, you can get to any other and you can get to any other call. Thank you. So, Micah or Mika? Uh, Micah. Micah. Hi, Micah. So he says that the psalm said, Be still and know that I am God. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. I often think about like, I mean, the truth of the matter is God is all around us. In other words, if we take an honest look at the natural world and all the wonders around us in creation, we'd be so overwhelmed with wonder, so overwhelmed with awe. In fact, Maimonides speaks about it in the, um, the, the three-year cycle. I do the three-year. Maybe you are studying the uh, three, three-chapter cycle, but in the, in, there's a yearly cycle of studying all of the Mishnah Torah, all of Maimonides' halachic work. Uh, and uh, if you do three chapters a day, it takes a year. If you do one chapter, it takes three years. I'd do the one chapter. And we're going through again, Mada, the, 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 the beginning, which is the, how do you translate Mada in English? Um, anyway, but it's the first volume. It's knowledge, basically. Divine, divine Torah knowledge. The basis, the fundamentals of Torah uh, and Judaism. And... Uh, he discusses this there as a few paragraphs. I think more than once he talks about if a person looks around at the world and sees the incredible wisdom, the infinite uh, uh, intellect and power and grandeur, he immediately says, uh, he immediately, immediately will be full of awe and love of the creator of all this. I think he says love first. First, the prayer will immediately feel love and then a tremendous a tremendous awe, almost like a terror, and they don't think how small he is, and what a small little um, pitiful creature he is in the face of all this. How come we don't feel this way? It makes sense. Isn't he right? And But we don't feel this way. Why not? Because, primarily because we're so busy with, the first thing we see is our own needs. We look around. What is the things that we see? what we want. That's what we pick up. You look around, oh, that's beautiful. You know, maybe I want to buy that. Oh, maybe this, maybe this person, or maybe that person I want to marry. Maybe, you know, if you're single. Isn't that the first? The first thing is the animal part of the person is picking up on their wants. That's what you see around. Just like, a, just like a, the animals, what are they looking around for? Food. I have two cats. I understand. I'm not really a big expert in this, but I understand that they see the color red. They don't really see other colors. Why? Because blood, they have to see, right? I mean, they're hunters, so they, they're given the ability to pick up on what they need. I think that that our animalist type soul is kind of hunting around. The eyes are looking for its needs all the time. We don't see because we have to quiet our needs first. If we quieted the selfish impulses, then immediately we'd, we'd feel what Maimonides is saying. But first, we have to really open our eyes. And by that, we have to quiet our soul and selfishness. And so if you think about it, what an incredible experience it would be if we were just quiet and we would take in all of the world, all of creation, and we'd be so full of love and inspiration, you know. And then we'd obviously, we'd turn to doing kindness to others because we'd realize, wait a minute, there's this infinite creator and he's constantly vivifying the world and giving life to the world. And he's giving so much beauty and feeling. He's letting all of the creatures enjoy their food and their air and everything around them and, and so on. He's setting also limits. The person also gets filled with a bit of fear. There's death. There's troubles. So he sees there's judgment. So he sees both. But overwhelmingly, there's good. That's why I always you know people sometimes are nihilistic and they say, oh, the world is so bad. 
And I say, you know why you're so bad? It's because you're so spoiled. You're so used to getting good that you only see the bad. But the fact is the bad is one thing in a big day is, is not doesn't go well. You're alive, you're feeling, you're healthy, you can think, you're all these things. And, and something went wrong, it's bad, it's terrible. It's just, look at how things go bad. Yeah, but most of the time it doesn't go bad. Or just put it another way, if the, oh, there's death. Yeah, but the only reason is death is because there's life. It doesn't have to be life. It doesn't have to be anything. Go to all the planets. In fact, what's the? why didn't God make all these planets and they're empty, there's nothing there? To teach us a lesson. To teach us, right? It's clear. It's in our face. Really, there should be nothing. But I'm giving you all this blessing, all this richness, and I put place you here to get to know me, to serve me, to take care of this wonderful world. I want to show you my qualities. So I brought all this about for you, for mankind. Doesn't have to be that way. You know, it's all this talk of going to Mars, there's nothing there. They're looking, looking, looking. I was watching a documentary about, you know, they sent... Uh, when was it? Back in the 70s, or they sent, you know, different, uh, in the 80s, they sent the diff different uh, uh, auto automated, you know, ships there, unmanned to Mars, looking for water. Maybe they'll find signs of water. Maybe they'll find some little piece of ice somewhere which shows, which shows what? I mean, look at this world. They're spending billions of dollars. Maybe they'll find a little water over there. It's not sustain anything. I mean, how much would cost a fortune to... Anyway, so... Anyway, I go, I go far afield, but my point is simply that humility and, and silencing our own needs is a source of, of, of basically all wisdom. So it's, it's really the fundamental quality a person has to have, and you can't learn unless you quiet your own thoughts also. Listen to those who have more wisdom than yourself. So that's a more practical element of it. So <clears throat> now, today is, it's also the day of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you may know, the day of the great sage of Israel. May, may his merit protect us, Rabbi Simon, the son of Yochai, who was a student of Rabbi Akiva, one of our, maybe the greatest, besides Moses, the greatest, teacher of Torah of all time, who was martyred by the Romans, famously. I'm not going to get into that. It's a happy day right now. But Rabbi Shimon says about himself in the Zohar that he was constantly cleaving to God, that he was unified with God. And that's why I, it's clear that he passed away on this day, because he was pure humility also. I love this story. You may have heard this story, but you can even just Google the stories about Rabbi Shimon. And I, I, this past Sabbath, a rabbi was talking a little bit about Rabbi Shimon. And, you know, he was in the cave for 13 years. He was in a cave in the Galilee, hiding from the emperor, from the Romans. Uh, I feel very connected to Rabbi Shimon. He was a fearless servant of God and a rebel. You know, he just spoke up against the Romans. He wasn't afraid. Well, then he had to run away. But uh, nevertheless, he said his piece. But the story goes, and he stayed in the in, in a cave with his son, Elazar, for 12 years. And they ate carobs and dates um, and drank. There was a river. God made a miracle as a river ran through it. And there was a, a tree that gave him those fruits for 12 years. They studied Torah in the cave. And didn't come out. Um, the different versions, but they they so anyway, my our the rabbi was talking about what an experience, what a spiritual high. But what he forgets to mention is the fact that the story goes that when he came out, his skin was so scarred. One opinion says the reason was because they would sit in sand, unclothed in order not to ruin their clothing for prayer. And then every time, and then three times a day, I guess for prayer, they put the clothes back on. Otherwise they were sunken in sand. There's another view that they had some kind of skin disease that they got in the, in the, in the cave. I wouldn't be surprised. They got no sunlight for 12 years. 
So they, and in any event, the point is, is that when he came out, his relative, I believe it's his son-in-law, his son-in-law saw him and he started weeping, saw Rabbi Shimon because he was so scarred and emaciated from being all those years in the cave. And he started crying. Uh, Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair, I think it says, he started crying as his son-in-law. And he said, don't cry. Don't cry because with this, I gained Torah knowledge that beyond, beyond what was possible. So, so such self-sacrifice to gain such Torah knowledge that was for, for generations. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other stories known about him also. The famous story that everybody says is that he and his son, well, it's it's brought in the in the in the Talmud in, in Tractate Sabbath. Shabbat, that when he came out and then he'd see people, they'd see people uh, working the fields that uh, Rabbi Elazar would, they'd see, would see them work in the fields. And why they, how could they work in the fields and, and, and giving up eternal life of Torah study just, just in order to, to gain something from possessions and that the fields, they would, would, they would just with their eyes looking at it in, 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 Rabbi Lazar looked the fields would, would, would be aflame. And then Rabbi Shimon would look at it and, and, and cure the curse, so to speak, or this, this, uh, this judgment that would come upon it from Rabbi Lazar's gaze. Anyway, and then basically, um, I think, oh, I'm not getting the story on, but a voice came out from heaven and said, you came out to destroy my world, go back into your cave. And they went back into the cave for another. You could check that you'll see the story. Maybe, maybe the correction. I think I may have got it a little wrong there. I think for Rabbi Shimon, that happened when they came out the second time. The first time they came out and they'd see someone, what is it that this person is sowing and reaping when they could be involved in, in, in eternal life of Torah study? And they and the fields would burn. So a voice came out and said, Go back to your cave. They went back another 12 months. And they came out, and still Rabbi Lazar was still burning the fields, but Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, he would cure the, the damage done by, by his son, Elazar. I believe that's, that's what the Talmud tells us in Masechah Shabbos. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that the Rabbi Shimon is the epitome of Torah study. Everyone knows that Rabbi Shimon is basically represented the view of Total dedication to Torah study <clears throat> and relinquishing worldly pursuits for Torah study, kind of almost like an ascetism, I guess, almost not exactly, but just uh, um, you know, not engaging in in uh, in business at all. While other, most of the Tanaic uh, scholars, they would, as we find in Ethics of the Fathers, say say minimize your business activities. And try to primarily be busy yourself with Torah, but they didn't say not to do anything. They just said try to minimize it to your basic needs, and the rest of the time dedicate to Torah study. But Rabbi Shimon seems to be of the view that dedicate yourself to Torah study, and God will provide something to that effect. Or to complete, but the the complete minimalist certainly, complete minimalist. And and but the thing is, you can't say that he was a hypocrite about it. He lived it. He lived it. 13 years in a cave. So, but that's not the way we're supposed to live. That's not really the Torah. Is that, that's for only very unique individuals who are, whose lives are, their, their souls come down in this world in order to bring down very high levels of Torah to share and teach others. Uh, and which is exactly what Rabbi Shimon did. He came down into the world and he, his Torah is extremely prolific. He's full of, his, his, his sayings are full of the myth. The mission is full of his sayings, and obviously he's, he's the author. It's according to Kabbalistic tradition and, and the Orthodox tradition, he's the author of the, of the Zohar. So, I mean, he's really the father of so much of both Jewish law and Jewish thought and Jewish mysticism. Incredible. So, anyway, I have a message for the B'nai Noah community based on this, No Better Day, and... and I, there's no time to waste. 
in giving this message is study as much Torah related to the seven laws as you can. The, the Torah study is the fundamental. Talmud Torah connected Kulam. Torah study is ways as heavy as they are. If you don't know, then you can't become close. I just actually myself saw a statement in the Zohar recently that they refer to the wicked as those who choose not to know. They choose not to know God. If they're making a choice to be ignorant, that's the really beginning of a wicked person who's choosing to be apathetic, doesn't want to know. If you don't want to know, you can't strengthen yourself and your, and your morals and your values. You're making a conscious choice to, to stay away. And then obviously, as, as the ethics of the father says this past week, one sin brings another and so on and so forth. And then one mitzvah brings another. If you know Torah, you'll know to do one good deed, another good deed, and one leads to the next. If you don't know, then one thing leads to the next and the next. And 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 even things you that if you, if you're ignorant and you're doing things you don't know are wrong. But first of all, there, there's the judgment. Well, well, why didn't you learn? Why didn't you try? Why didn't you choose to know? It's the same thing about the knowledge of God, as we we're talking about character traits and under, if you don't choose to know that there's a God. Meaning to say you're, in a certain extent, consciously choosing not to care. That, that really, I mean, people don't generally look at it that way, but it's a form of evil. Because, well, again, basically the, the foundation is ignorance. And everything flows from ignorance. You don't know that there's a God who is a moral God. And you don't realize how great and kind he is. And then you don't study what it is that he wants. You're really at fault. And he said, well, I didn't know, but you chose as you're a free agent human being, you chose not to, not to seek it out. You have to seek it out. Now, obviously, the people here are already interested. In a certain sense, that's a tremendous, tremendous blessing and merit and will stand for, for you for eternity. No question. At the same time, it's also a greater responsibility because you also know more. So if you know more, then you should know more. If you know to know, then you should actually be studying. I often look at, uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the two sons of Aaron that, that died uh, upon going into the temple and what that's about and what we can learn. And uh, since also you're, this is my soapbox and you're my students, I also want to mention something about what I believe we can learn, a very simple lesson from the tragedy that happened in Meron, Rabbi Shimon's resting place last year. Now, I don't know the reason for it at all, but I can say this. In a holy place, you have to be extra careful how you behave, not less careful. And on the holy day of Rabbi Shimon's passing, maybe there was some infraction, God forbid, that cause and why that and the same thing. That's what, in other words, what I'm saying. People passing away on the Meron is like the sons of Aaron passing away in the Holy of Holies. People going holy, people going to serve God, but in a holy place. And you have to be even more careful how you behave. I don't know what was. I don't know what. But the point is simply is that one thing for sure we learn from it from the event is that as Mikdashai Tiro, you should fear my house. You should fear, you should fear, you should be fear the, that place that I have chosen. As Mikdash Tiro, you should fear the temple, I guess. I don't know how to translate the English, but a Mikdash, the 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 the, the, temp, the temple area, you should fear that place. You have to go there with fear and awe. You can't go in there like you put your feet up because you, you frequent the place or something like this. But this similarly. If you know, then you have to be, then, then you have more, then you're also more responsible. So on the one hand, so it's kind of like a minister, a royal minister. He speaks to the king. He can go into the royal palace, but he has to keep royal etiquette. If he's standing in front of the king and he misbehaves or he acts like he's in his house, he comes in his socks, you know, he's, he starts, uh, I don't know, scratching or something. That could be the death penalty. You can't behave like that in front of the king. So similarly, you have to be careful. <clears throat> um, obviously, this, this, this is also a great misunderstanding of the Gentiles over the generations, in that 
Look at the Jewish people. They suffer so much. Obviously, they're cursed. No, that's a big mistake. It's the opposite. It's because they're close that they're scrutinized. It's like Nadav and Aviyu. That's the lesson. And that's what Moses says there. And with those that I have become close, I sanctify myself with those who are close to me. Because what shows more fear of God than those who are closest to him, then they're also punished. First of all, as Rashi explains, because if someone, even the righteous, are punished, how much more so the wicked. But there's another point, too. The other point is that the righteous are close to God. Everyone knows God is, so to speak, more revealed in the place that the righteous are. So they have to act with greater decorum. And if something happens with them that shows, it makes people fear God because people know God was there. It was because of God that something happened. In other words, it was because of God's presence, not because of the lack of his presence. Does that make sense? In other words, bad things can happen because God, so to speak, isn't present. What does that mean? God's providence is not there. It's just natural. God allows for more natural occurrence and people get hurt because they're not being watched over by God, so to speak, even though God's everywhere. But there's less personalized care. On the other hand, the righteous is personalized care. So why were they punished? But the answer is because you're in the king's chambers. You're in the king's throne room. Any slight infraction, the slightest move of the nose the wrong way, punished. Chas v'shalom. have to be careful. Obviously, there's also another point. is The righteous are punished to teach them. That's even more. They're most, for the most part, Righteous person is punished only that they should learn. It's, it's a pedagogy for the most part. In other words, something happens to teach them. Wait, you did something wrong. Think about why did this happen to you? You can learn something. You know, if a person does something, especially nowadays, it's very hard to find teachers to teach us how to behave. So if we do, a, how do I say, how do I say, if, we, if we, have, we don't know what to do on a certain day, we have two options, do this or that. We pick one of them. And then that leads, in a way, to something negative. So that shows that was the wrong way. That was a mistake. Must be the other way. I can't exactly give an example, but but <clears throat> um, so anyway, anyway, may Hashem only be only show his his benevolence and kindness to the righteous, and, and obviously he does. He protects them in every every direction and in, in every way. But nevertheless, there is greater scrutiny. I mean, this is what our sages say, that Hashem is, scrutinizes with the righteous like, like, the thi- like the thinness of a hair. So this, I'm not making this up. This is, <laughs> this is something that our sages tell us. So I think that's the thing with Nadav and Avihu as well, that even though they brought in the fire at a time before it was, they were commanded not to do so, but there was still a certain degree of... of uh, it was a bit cavalier to do something they weren't commanded to do, even though they were doing it out of a passion for God. But still, they weren't commanded. The point is, is that you can only go into the Holy of Holies when you're commanded. Why? Because commanded is humility. You're doing it because I'm commanded like a servant. You're not doing it out of your own spiritual creativity. You're doing it out of, and you see all through the Bible, it says, and Moses did as he was commanded. Aaron did as he was commanded. The Jewish, the children of Israel did as they were commanded. That seems to be the biggest praise. They did what they were commanded. That's the biggest thing. Not to do your own thing. To do as you're commanded is even bigger. And again, I think it's this element that to do what you're commanded, person nullifies themselves to God's will. They, you allow the infinite to come into the finite. Because it's not you, it's God. Person can come to very high spiritual heights, but still it's always going to be limited. Because it's my own creativity. And that's also, there's a place for that. I'm not saying there isn't. But, but at the same time, that creativity within the sphere of as commanded is the highest level. <clears throat> so. That's my main point to say really is about Torah study. And... Um, at, to, to, to as much as you possible to, to eat up as much as you can about all the different branches of the seven laws and also to, um, as I always emphasize, to study the duties of the heart and such books about a person's relationship with God and inner, the, the inner uh, divine service, the love and fear of God, 
and to contemplate about God's greatness, particularly in that approach, is particularly good um, for the B'nai Noah community, and it focuses on really the basics every person needs to know is, is that he says an amazing thing. I have a, a, a partner studying duties at the heart. We're doing the gate of uh, trust. And um, one of the things he says there, which I, I think he says things similar many times, one of, but he says that he's talking about trust that God will give a person a reward. And he explains that really a person has to know that reward is a gift. Reward for good deeds is a gift. You say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Shouldn't I be rewarded for, get, for doing what God wants me to do, etc.? He says, no, no, you shouldn't. Because if you count all the good things God does for you, you'll never pay it back. You know, every moment of breath in your life and your existence and your parents and your health, and, and who knows the gazillion times something could have gone wrong. As I said before, every moment that this earth exists the way it is, is, is even the scientists say it's like the probability of the earth and life being here is like, I don't know, it's like a billions, like one out of a hundred, you know, 500 billion is something crazy, so, and something insane. Some, some insane, like you could never, you don't go to Vegas with that number. That's, uh, that's all I'm going to tell you. If those are your odds, forget it. Stay home. Certainly don't put any money on it. And that's yet, this is how the earth is. The probability, it's impo- it's, it's virtually, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So the point is, that means every moment, that probability is, is, is reinventing itself, so to speak. So if you really counted everything fairly, he's saying, you can never pay back. He really doesn't owe you anything because everything you do for him doesn't begin to pay back what he gave you. So there's no quid pro quo here. So really, it's all a gift. It's just that God has decreed that he's going to pay it back. So, um, you know, but it also helps the person be happy. I've spoken about it many times. If we think about life in that way, it's just so hard for us because we, we grow up, you know, that's not how we, how this society teaches us to think about life. So it's just very hard to, break out of the mold of being depressed, of feeling like we're owed so much and we don't have it. When in reality, there's another thing he says, by the way, which is that, yeah, a person should be satisfied with the minimum. If a person has any more than he needs, well, he does say the minimum, he, they, they translate it as, he should, after he has enough to maintain himself, the rest he should give away for God's will, whatever. In other words, basically it appears that for charity and other commandments, and good deeds, the rest of his, his money, livelihood, he should give away. Obviously, that's a person who trusts in God, uh, you know, allowed for the next day. I mean, it may include some, some protection for, you know, to be able to live at hard times. That might be a part of the maintenance. But after that point, the rest of it, person shouldn't waste. You know, this, is, this is, uh, appears to be high levels, but the point of me bringing it up is to show that we could break out of this depression of not having the fancier car or the house or whatever it is that people are trying to get and realize that we don't need any of these things. Um, again, if someone is, as our sages say, someone who studies Torah, he's free. You're free from all these shackles of having of of the uh, you know of of the um, marketing class putting all these. Uh, there's needs that we have to have so many different things. Um, yeah, it appears, I mean, if Rabbi Shimon could live 12 years in a cave on fruit and water, he must have been a lot healthier when he started than I am. I can tell you that much. <laughs> so I just mean people had a lot less, but they seemed to be quite healthy a lot of the time. I mean, people who didn't get sick, I guess, from sicknesses and when they were ch- very small children, they seemed to be very healthy. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, so it's almost eight o'clock. I haven't let you share anything. I, we will go back to our regular studies, um, but I just kind of want to get off with some ideas about um, that I wanted to share with you. 
And I do hope that you look into this, this uh, little calendar that I mentioned, because remember one of our fundamental rules is that um, any, any commandment that's not for the children of Noah, but as a rational basis, um, can be adopted, maybe even should be adopted. And so if we turn the Omer into a time of character refinement, basic, you know, basic character um, dealing with other people and character refinement, there's absolutely no reason why, and, and actually just the opposite, Beno should use the time to improve, use, the, the, use it as a springboard. You don't have to, you can improve your character anytime you want. You don't have to fit into the Jewish calendar, but and a person should improve their character anytime they feel like. But the point is, this is just such an opportune time. And it's a very, it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, and obviously the other point is this is a time that really belongs to all of mankind. And that is because it's a preparation for the giving of the Torah. And the generations before Israel, you know, before Israel was, was created in the time of the patriarchs, we've spoken about this many times, was, is also specifically related, obviously, to the children of Noah, as the patriarchs themselves kept the Torah in a form that was similar, because they were B'nai Noah. So um, this time is kind of, uh, in a certain sense, a certain elements of, um, of B'nai Noah's observance, even for Jews. Anyway, I'll leave that mysterious statement for another time.